Hello and welcome to today's episode in which I'll talk through how to set up a vegan pantry. A little while back I put a post on my community tab asking what kind of content people wanted to see and a couple people asked about how I stock my pantry to make sure I've got you know, good base ingredients in stock. As I go through the items, I'll mention recipes that I've used it in. And I'll put together a list of all of the links so you can see the ingredients in action, as it were. Potentially do a playlist for you as well. We'll see. There won't be a specific order to the ingredients as such. It's just gonna, I'm gonna go in the cupboards in sort of a methodical way. <laughs> methodical in my mind anyway. Probably won't show the inside of the cupboards because they're messy. They're like a, a Pinterest before picture. <laughs> before organizing yeah i mean the problem is the cupboards the shelves are really deep so you end up with loads of wasted space and then everything just crammed on the bottom of the shelf i like to have a nice selection of starchy carbohydrates that are shelf stable so pasta is a really good one for things like that keep things in like a plastic tub just to keep it somewhat together so i've got classic spaghetti just wheat spaghetti but then i've also got some corn based so that's gluten free each has the place you know if you're trying to cut down on your wheat consumption the corn one's a really good alternative it's got a really nice taste and texture and i've also got some brown rice spaghetti as well the gluten free alternatives taste really good it doesn't feel like you're missing out but they are much more expensive i think this is like one pound fifty two pounds maybe and that's I don't know, 80 pence, and you get triple the amount maybe. One note on gluten-free pastas that I found so far is that it breaks very easily once it's cooked. When I did the assassin spaghetti, I used the corn pasta and it broke into small pieces, whereas the wheat pasta maintains its integrity a little bit better. I also keep pasta type things. So this is a whole wheat fusilli. I bought this to make pasta chips with it and I got whole wheat so that I could riff on twiglets. It's like a marmite coated snack that's made from whole wheat flour, but they make an incredible snack and they're really, really cheap to make as well. Then I've also got a few different types of noodles as well. I like having vermicelli noodles on hand like this because they don't need to be cooked on the stove. You just cover them in boiling water and let them sit for sort of five to 10 minutes and they soften up. And I've got two other kind of noodles. I've got udon, which are the really thin thick flat ones they're made from wheat and then I've got soba noodles which are made from buckwheat so these are gluten free I did some teriyaki noodles in the style of assassin spaghetti so you just put these in a frying pan and then ladle stock into it and cook it that way I've got some sago pearls these ones are made from tapioca and this one sago is like a blend of tropical starches these are really nice in a dish called subadana kichdi so you soak these in cold water for a few hours and they become quite plump and then you fry that off with some onions and spices and you've got an amazing little side dish and again gluten free i'm going to include couscous in this section i think it's semolina which is a type of wheat and again this one you just do one part couscous to one part hot water, boiling water. And then I put it in like a Tupperware dish or in a bowl covered with a plate. And then you just let it soak for five minutes and it plumps up really nicely. I use this to make sheets tabbouleh, like a salad, but this is a really nice one to have and it's cheap as well. The second tub here is things like pulses and grains. I did a separate video that was an in-depth look into legumes and pulses. So I won't kind of repeat myself in this section. I'll just briefly mention what I've got in this tub. Got gungo peas, cannellini beans, chickpeas. So they're just great for hummus, snacking. You can make like crispy chickpeas, that kind of thing. Got this tour dal, which is yellow split peas. I bought these to make a snack with. So you cook them off and then pan fry them until they go crisp. Got kidney beans, which are fantastic for things like chilies, or you can bulk up a bolognese with things like that. I also use kidney beans in one of the gluten-free seitans. So they add a bit of body, also a bit of texture and flavor as well. I've got dried broad beans here. I've used them in something and I can't remember what it was. I don't think I filmed it, but the skin is very tough. So if you do find them, what I do is soak them, cook them, and then take the skin off and I've got a couple of different types of lentils so these are green lentils and then these are lentil ver I've also got some red lentils found a random one that's in a separate jar things like the lentils these I've used in the first shepherd's pie this type keeps the shape and texture so they've remained quite firm whereas for example the red lentils the split ones they go quite mushy but then that mushiness is great in things like the chicken liver pate that I made and that kind of thing. So for things like this, you could fry off a garlic and some onions, pop in the cooked lentils and then blitz it down into like a spread pate kind of thing. I've got buckwheat grains here. Despite them being called wheat, 
they're completely gluten-free and it's a complete protein as well, which means it has all of the amino acids, essential amino acids that humans need. So these have got a really nice texture, a nice bit of bite to them, similar to rice maybe, but they've got like a really delicious nutty flavor to them. So it's really nice as a side grain. This is bulgur wheat. This is kernels of wheat that have been cracked. So it's like little pieces of wheat. So again, really nice as a grain, as a side dish. You can put it in salads. This is what they make tabbouleh with. But this takes sort of 15, 20 minutes to cook on the stove. This is amaranth grain. It's known as an ancient grain. So it's, you know, what early humans would eat. It's a little bit like millet. It's that kind of texture to it and a bit like quinoa. Pearl barley is a really nice one to have on hand. If you see pearl on something, it means it's had the husk removed, the bran that's on the outside that's been removed. So this makes a really nice risotto. You just mix this in with some veggies and some stock, bang it in the oven and then forget about it for an hour. And it's almost impossible to overcook as well. Great texture, nice bit of flavour to it. I mean, it's a mild flavour, but it's more flavour than rice, for example. I also like keeping quinoa in stock. Sometimes to have it, again, as a grain to serve under things, like a bolognese or a chilli, that kind of thing, so use it in place of rice. I've used this in burgers. I did it in the not shepherd's pie. It works fantastically well in things like the shepherd's pie because it mimics that texture that minced beef has, like that crunch you get sometimes in minced beef. I think this one's also a complete protein. I also have several different varieties of rice. Different rices have got different flavours and textures to them. This is black rice. It's also known as forbidden rice and it's kind of purple when you cook it. This has got a really nutty taste and a very crunchy and yummy texture. I use this in the purple tempeh. I've also got red rice, like a long grain type rice. And again, nice texture and lovely color to it as well. And then the white rice that I buy in bulk is basmati and I buy like five kilo bags of it. It just works out so much cheaper. Got some cooked leftover from dinner the other night. It goes nice and fluffy. I've always got a jar of polenta to hand. So this is dried corn that's been coarsely ground. If I've remembered it correctly, corn is a vegetable, a fruit, and a grain. Polenta is a really handy thing to keep in stock. You can make wet polenta, so it's almost like wet mashed potato kind of texture. I served the sherry mushrooms on top of wet polenta. I use this as a topping in place of mashed potato on a shepherd's pie. The winter warmer pie and the Mediterranean chorizo and veg pie that I did. It's just different from potato. You know, it's got an extra bit of flavor. It's got a firmer texture as well, which is can be quite nice. You can also bake with it. I think I used it in the maple pecan cookies and you can also grind it down finer and use it as cornmeal, which I did for the cornbread, I think it was. Very handy thing to have on hand. Moving on to canned goods, tinned if you're in the UK. So I keep a few different types of beans. I've got chickpeas, cannellini beans, that kind of thing. These are useful fallbacks. So if I've forgotten to soak beans the night before, or if I don't want to wait for the instant pot to cook them, just whip these out of the cupboard. Chickpeas are great, like I mentioned before, for hummus or making, I mean, I've heated them up in the microwave, mash it down with a bit of olive oil and some herbs. Just a nice little spread. I use canned chickpeas in the kind of tuna type salad I did in the vegan mayo video. So it just crush them down, mix them with some other nice bits. I buy chopped tomatoes in bulk from Costco. You get like a pack of 12. And I think it's a fiver, maybe something like that. So it just works out super cheap. But these make a great quick little pasta sauce, that kind of thing. I've also used this to do like a passata, like with the assassin spaghetti. I just blended that down with a stick blender. Also got baked beans, because you've got to have baked beans. I'll do cheese on toast with some baked beans. Just a very nice, quick, satisfying little meal. I've started buying cans of this from the supermarket as well, which is tofu chunks in soy and spring onion. They're not the cheapest way of buying tofu. I think it's maybe one pound, one pound fifty or something like that for a tin. But the bonus of it is because it's quite a firm tofu and it doesn't need refrigerating. So it's, you know, again, a bit of a space saver in terms of fridge space. Just heat it up in a pan. I add in extra soy sauce and stuff because there's never enough <laughs> flavour in these things. So yeah, just a really nice thing to have, especially if you need a quick meal in a hurry. You know, that kind of thing would be useful to take into work. You could probably do that in the microwave. Another really handy shelf stable protein source are these textured soy protein pieces. These two I got from the Chinese supermarket. So they do, there's like, they call it minced fish. I'm not 100% sure why. These are like a pork chop. So you can see the shape of it there. These ones are found in Sainsbury's, which is like a big chain supermarket over here. So I think more mainstream retailers are starting to stock this kind of thing as well. To prepare them, you just soak them in, you can either do it in boiling water or stock or, you know, something with flavor in it to get more flavor in there. 
and it rehydrates, plumps up. The soaking time will depend on the size and shape of them. I think the pork chop ones take maybe 15 minutes sitting in hot water, whereas these ones take like five to seven minutes. I used this type in the two slow cooker recipes that I did. I made a chicken cacciatore and then a steak and ale stew. And you just put them in dry in with the liquid and vegetables. And then by the time the veg are cooked, this is hydrated nicely. Super handy to have on hand. They take up very little space in the cupboard. I haven't done it myself yet, but I've seen, I think it's on fullofplants.com and you make like a meat floss by putting this in the food processor. I think they use the the dough hook, like the kneading blade rather than the cutting blade. It kind of breaks it down into long fibers. It's a riff on a Chinese topping for rice and that kind of thing. At some point I might give it a go because it looks quite interesting. You're gonna to want to get yourself some flavoring stock type things of some description. These days there's more and more options when it comes to stock powder, especially for vegans. This is the one a lot of people will be most familiar with, a stock cube. It's concentrated vegetables that they somehow extract and process down into a cube. The way to use a stock cube typically is to mix it in boiling water, hot water, and then add it into whatever, or you can crumble it down and sprinkle it into a sauce, that kind of thing. You can drop the cube in whole into, for example, hot water, but I find it takes ages to break it down. So I just, you know, either cut it or crumble it down into a smaller pieces just to make it a bit faster. I've got these plant-based stock powders. This is the Muscle brand. So it's like a powder like that. And I've got chicken flavor and beef flavor. The beef flavor I use in things like burgers, shepherd's pie, lasagna, bolognese, that kind of thing. The chicken one is good for lighter flavored dishes. I also use the chicken as a base if I wanna make something bacon flavored, because it's got more of a, a neutral flavor, not neutral, but a milder flavor than the beef one has. And then I can start adding more bacon type flavors into that. Things like smoked paprika, sumac, that sort of thing. These powders are really nice as well if you pack it on the outside of tofu. So I did it with the chicken Kievs and I did the induction tofu, cut grids into it just to get a bit of extra crisp texture on top, pack it in the stock powder and then air fry it. It just gives a nice bit of extra flavor on there. Not necessarily has to be chicken flavor, it's just a flavor of some sort because tofu is very bland in flavor. You can also get liquid stock in these little capsule type things. If I'm honest, the flavor is a bit better than the cubes, but I just find that so wasteful. Like, do you know what I mean? This, a plastic pot and a plastic lid, it's just a bit excessive. I've also got this bacon flavor seasoning. I used this most recently on the polenta crisps, I think it was. I did like a smoky bacon flavor. I bought this on eBay, I think it was, and I think it's intended to be used on crisps. It's a crisp seasoning, potato chips, if you're in the States. Sulcan tofu is a useful one to have in the cupboard because it comes in these Tetra packs doesn't need to be refrigerated. I've used this in a variety of different dishes. I've used it as a base for ice cream when I did the cranberry sauce ice cream on the pecan sweet potato pie. If I do a tofu scramble, I've started using this rather than the regular type of tofu that you store in the fridge. It just gives more of a soft, eggy kind of texture to it. And I also use it to make cottage cheese. So you pan fry the tofu to get the excess liquid off and it forms like little curds, like a cottage cheese. Bit of plain yogurt, bit of lactic acid powder, cottage cheese, it's amazing. After I finish this video, I'm gonna go straight into making some gnocchi using silken tofu. So keep your eye out for that video as well. I like keeping a couple of different dried vegetables as well. So I've got dried mushrooms. These are dried lion's mane mushrooms. I use these in the tuna salad along with the chickpeas. Also in the barbecue, jackfruit because it's got a very meaty texture when you shred it down. Very handy to have. Also in the bourguignon and the stroganoff. So it's, again, it's just a nice thing. You can pull out the cupboard. It doesn't need any fridge space. You can hydrate them in just hot water or you can take that opportunity to get more flavor inside them. I also have a jar of dried shiitake mushrooms. Again, you can rehydrate them and use them in cooking or you can powder those. You can see that one where I've grated it down. So it makes a nice seasoning, bit of umami flavor. Then I've also got a jar of dried onion pieces. You can hydrate them and then fry them off and get a bit of color on, that's fine. I also use them in the sauce vierge that I did with the sweet potato gnocchi. I'm gonna use them again in the tofu dish that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna mix these with some broad beans and some other bits. These are currently soaking in vermouth. I also keep a variety of different flowers. So I've got lots of wheat flowers, like self-raising, plain bread flowers, that kind of thing which you'll see more in depth in the video 
the specific basics of flower video that I'll link to. Pulled out a few of the other ones that I've got. So I've got gram flower. This is a mix of chickpeas and yellow split peas. This makes a handy filling for little savory tartlets and pies. I use this as one of the layers in the za'atar tarts. You can make paste almost, that kind of thing with it. I also use this in the peanut butter and jelly cookies. It's got a very kind of cakey sort of texture to it. It's got more body than some of the gluten-free flours have got. It does also have a taste to it though that's quite distinctive. Not necessarily unpleasant, but it's there, so you need to kind of mask it with other flavours like peanut butter or chocolate. It goes really nicely in chocolate cookies, that kind of thing. I've got glutinous rice flour. This is also known as sweet rice flour. I think this is what they make mochi balls with. It's ice cream stuffed inside chewy wrapper kind of thing, like a little ball. I think I also use it in a cake, maybe the sticky toffee Jamaican ginger to give it a nice bit of chewiness. I've got teff flour here. I think it's used a lot in Ethiopian cuisine. Again, a gluten-free flour. I bought this to make one of the gluten-free seitans. Um, I've still got a massive quantity, so I need to start thinking of ways of using it up. Uh, it's got a slightly nutty kind of flavour to it. I've also got these. So that's a very finely milled cornmeal. And this is masa harina. This is flour that's made from corn that's been treated with lime. If you've had a tortilla chip, that flavour, that's the masa. I use this in the soft taco recipe to make the taco shells. Very distinct flavour. That flavour won't necessarily go with everything, but it's useful to have on hand because you only need you know a bit and then it keeps for years in terms of baking and sweet treat type of things you're going to want a few different types of sugar so i've got light brown soft sugar similar flavor to the packets of brown sugar that you get in a cafe it gives an extra layer of flavor in your baking and then dark brown soft sugar i think when sugar's refined they take the molasses out of it and then with brown sugar they put it back in so just to varying degrees. So this has got a very deep molasses, treacly kind of flavor. You wouldn't want to use this type of thing in all of your baking unless you want that flavor. So for example, if you wanted to do a Victoria sponge, a very light flavored cake, that kind of thing, or a lemon drizzle, you're going to end up with the flavor of the sugar. When it's called for, it's delicious, but if you want something very mild and neutral, stay away from anything like that. Also got some condensed milk. I can't remember how to pronounce it, but I tried to do like a dolce de leche with this so i put it in the instant pot for two hours left it overnight and when you do it with a dairy version it caramelizes and goes really golden and dark in color it didn't work so well with this because this is made from starches rather than milk still tasted good but it's useful to have you can put it in ice creams that kind of thing got cartons of coconut cream so the difference between this and coconut milk which i also have cans of as well this is very thick this is different than creamed coconut creamed coconut is uh, it's like finely grated coconut flesh. This is the fat that comes off the coconut milk. So if you've had a can of coconut milk in the cupboard or in the fridge, it'll separate the creams on top and that's what this is. This is great in things like dessert, so you can use it in place of a heavy cream. I've also used it in the pom puree that I made with the steak and ale stew. Because as soon as you start adding flavor into coconut cream, it takes on that flavor and stops tasting like coconut. And I keep some cheap bars of chocolate if I wanna do any baking. Chop this down and use it in chocolate chip cookies. You can make a ganache like I did with the sweet potato, chestnut tart, that kind of thing. The more cocoa there is in there, the stronger the chocolate flavor will be. So it just depends on what you want really. Like if you're making chocolate brownies, I'd stay away from milk chocolate because it's just not gonna have that intensity that a dark chocolate would have. You're gonna to want to have some sort of thickener slash thickeners in stock for thickening things like apple pie filling, stir fry sauces, that kind of thing. I'll link to the starches video that I did where I did a comparison of a few different ones so you can see the properties of each. So I'm not gonna go into detail, but as a basic one to have cornstarch, I'd say go for cornstarch if you're just starting to stock up a pantry rather than going nuts for all kinds of different thickeners. Cornstarch is pretty much the most versatile and the easiest one to control. So I made a stir fry sauce the other night. I got a bowl of water, added loads of soy sauce, Maggie seasoning. Um, what else did I put in there? Some other bits and pieces and then a, a big heap tablespoon of cornstarch. I whisked everything together until it was smooth. I then added that into the hot pan and the heat from the pan starts activating the gelling process of the starch. Because if you put powder into hot liquid, it starts gelling and you get these huge clumps that are just gross <laughs> and you can't really get them back out again without 
a massive amount of whiskey. It's nice to have a variety of nuts and dried fruit in the cupboards as well. Partly for snacking, like if I suddenly get very hungry, I'll have a handful of almonds or something and it just takes the edge off until I can make some food. Cooked with nuts in the Mediterranean polenta topped pie, I put almonds in that one. I use cashews and stir fries, just gives a nice bit of crunch and texture in there as well. Put flaked almonds in something and I can't think what it was, but again, just for a nice bit of crunch in there because it's just really satisfying in your back teeth. Ground almonds are really nice in baking. It adds a nice bit of moistness to cakes, that kind of thing. I guess you could put it in brownies. I tend not to put dried fruit in my cooking so much. <laughs> the reason being the texture, is, it's a surprise and then I it makes me cringe. <laughs> like it reminds me of when I used to eat steak and I get a bit of gristle and it just makes me shudder. Uh, so that's if I eat something with raisins, like couscous with raisins, I have to pick it all out. I keep a nice selection of nuts and fruits for making granola. So I'll put the two videos where I've made granola. I did one using a protein shake instead of any fat and sugar. Worked really well, went super crunchy. And I also made one like a classic style with sugar and fat. And then I made a fat-free granola using aquafaba, which is the water you get out of chickpeas worked fantastically well. At some point in the future, I'm gonna do a separate video on oils and vinegars, so I can talk you through how they're made, what vinegar is, <laughs> uh, and just go a bit deeper into it. But as a very brief outline, I keep sunflower oil mostly for frying with. If you wanna know how to make this bottle stopper, keep an eye out for the video. I'm in the process of cutting it together now, so that's made out of a book. I keep extra virgin olive oil to use on salads or if I'm doing roast veg, that kind of thing, because it's got like a nice flavour to it. I keep toasted sesame in stock to use as finishing oil. For example, on that stir fry, I just sprinkled some on at the end just to add a little dimension of flavour. You don't want to cook with it really because it destroys the flavour, it like changes it and it can become a bit acrid as well. I also use walnut oil as a salad dressing because it's got a really distinctive flavour that's lovely in salads. And then for vinegars, I've got like the classic apple cider vinegar, which is again, nice in salad dressings, that kind of thing, just gives a nice bit of brightness. I've got some balsamic vinegar, which is nice. Bit of extra virgin olive oil, drizzle of balsamic and dunk bread in it, which is a nice little snack. I recently bought this to give it a try. I don't think I've ever tried it before. It's black rice vinegar. It's got the tangy note that white vinegar does, like white rice vinegar, but then it's also, it's got like a licorice molasses kind of note to it. If I want a quick little snack and I've got some white rice cooked in the fridge, I'll heat that up and drizzle on a bit of the black rice vinegar and some soy sauce. Just makes a nice little snack to munch on. If you ever watched a cooking show and you've heard them talk about seasoning, typically what they mean is salt and pepper. That's the kind of classic French definition of seasoning. So I keep some pink salt, I need to fill this up. I've got pink salt in a mill. I also have a tub of finely ground sea salt, which is just more useful for baking if I need to get a specific amount rather than grinding it. <laughs> I need to fill this one up as well. So I've got whole black peppercorns. You can buy sort of either cracked black pepper or ground black pepper, but I prefer doing it as and when, just because the flavor stays punchier. One of my patrons recently bought me these tiny little pepper and salt mills <laughs> that I had on my Amazon wish list. This one's got Sichuan peppercorns in it and that one's got black salt. It's very high in sulfur so it tastes like eggs. So it's really useful in the scrambled eggs for example. I'll sometimes put this on some avocado if I want a quick snack and it tastes like a hard boiled egg. I've most likely missed out a ton of stuff that people would find helpful but I didn't sleep last night and I'm starting to crash. <laughs> so I'm gonna wind this video up by showing you my spice drawer. So this is where I keep all of my herbs and spices, all in alphabetical order for the most part. Apart from that, that should be under the allspice. Rather than having everything on a shelf, I had a spare drawer, so I just sort of put everything in there with some cardboard dividers. This drawer I've built up over years. There's bits and pieces that I just buy every now and then and stock back up again. If you're first setting up a kitchen, what I'd say go for is something like a jar of general mixed herbs. So that's got things like oregano, basil, marjoram, thyme, that kind of thing. That's useful for things like French and Italian type flavorings. I'd go for onion granules or onion powder, and that's just dried onion that's been powdered, and the same of garlic. So that's just really good for getting really deep flavors into something without having to peel and chop onions and garlic. Garam masala. So this is a blend of like coriander, cumin, turmeric, cinnamon, black pepper, that kind of thing for Indian dishes. If you like spicy food, you'll then want chili of some sort. So I've got chili powder, chili flakes, cayenne pepper. Cayenne's quite a powerful, punchy one. The chili powder's a little bit more mellow. And then the flakes, that's nice. 
you know, on top of things like pizza, that kind of thing. So as I'd say go for those as your basics. Then maybe go for something like a smoked paprika. Paprika is basically pepper that's been dried, you know, like a bell pepper, that sort of thing and smoked so it brings a really nice smoky kind of flavor to things as long as you keep them out of direct sun they're going to keep for years they might not maintain the same level of freshness but you know they'll be fine if people are interested i'll do a deeper dive into the herbs and spices that i use another useful one to have on hand is msg monosodium glutamate it has a lot of savory flavor but with very little sodium so it is useful to have to get that umami flavor punched right up it's got quite a bad reputation but i'll stick a link down in the description because it basically stems down to racism hopefully that's given you some ideas of things that you might like to think about keeping stocked up if you find something you like as well, it's worth buying, you know, maybe a couple of them because there's nothing worse than falling in love with something and then not being able to find it next time you're in the shop. If there's anything in particular you really want to know about, ask away in the comments and I'll see what I can do for you. Maybe do a video or try and include it in another video. I'm going to take this moment to say a great big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. I've seen conflicting advice on whether you should name other channels because apparently YouTube suppresses it, but then I've seen recent videos where they've not suppressed it and i don't know so i'm just going to go ahead and say thank you your support is most welcome you're helping me keep this channel going so it's greatly appreciated hit subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to be alerted whenever there's a new video i do vegan recipes ingredient deep dives and sort of cooking related basics while you're waiting for the next one have a look at this